uh, in whose offices you sit and uh, co-editor of uh, Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy, uh, whose uh, social hour this is, monthly social hour, uh, wonderfully featuring uh, this evening our friend uh, Scott Redd, who uh, is the chief of a Reformed Theological Seminary DC campus, and uh, we're privileged that he has spoken at uh, several Providence events. Uh, will be speaking to us this evening on an always uh, timely topic, uh, which is uh, how do Christians, specifically Christians in his tradition, the Reformed or Calvinist tradition, look at God's vocation for government. And that's an issue that's at the crux of what Providence is all about, uh, in that uh, uh, the core of the state's responsibilities, as we see it, is to provide for the protection and security over which uh, God has uh, placed it. And so I'm sure Scott will offer us uh, many uh, insights on this topic. And I just want to uh, make sure if any of you are with us for the first time, and if you're not on our Providence uh, invite list, be sure to give me uh, your uh, card or information so we can be sure to include you for next time. So Scott, thanks so much uh, for joining us. And uh, speak as long as you would like, and then we'll take uh, questions and comments uh, afterwards. Thank you, Mark. Speak as long as I would like, as long as that is 15 minutes. Right? <laughs> right? So, um, given I will, uh, given the uh, just time constraints and uh, the desire to be somewhat introductory, I, I, I may run the risk here of saying some things that some of you, coming out of if you're coming out of even kind of a reformed or even sort of broadly evangelical camp, you may say, "Oh, yeah, this is kind of old hat," and for some of you, this may be, you know radically new and outlandish. Uh, but I'm going to try to kind of cut right down the middle, give you some of the unique aspects of the reformed approach, the primary duties, primary vocation, as Mark put it, of uh, the government. And as I do that, um, of course, I should define what does it mean to be reformed. And being reformed is typically, it's one of those kind of tricks of historical classification that you would think that the reformed tradition starts in the Reformation, but it does not. Luther is not considered reformed. That's a different tradition. Uh, typically speaking, reformed tradition begins in that second generation, which might be, you might say, begins with um, Calvin. You do see um, flavors of it in Melanchthon's uh, Lutheran tradition. Um, but typically, it's Calvin, Calvin's work in Geneva, and as it gets communicated around the continent of Europe, and that would be continental reformed tradition typically Dutch and German Reformed traditions and Swiss Reformed traditions, and then the UK, okay, which would be the, of course, uh, the, the British, the English Reformation, we might say, and that's where many of uh, the Puritans, who will later come to the United States, uh, are coming out of, they're coming out of that English Reformation, influenced heavily by John Knox, who studied in Geneva under Calvin and has brought back um, you know, this tradition to England, and some would say it's the worst thing that happened in English history, and some would say it's a great blessing of God that that happened in English history. I'll leave that up to you to decide. Um, what we're going to try to discuss tonight, though, is, is I'd like to discuss some basic tenets of the Reformed tradition that undergird its public theology. I will do this in brief, recognizing that what I say is probably going to spark a whole lot of questions of clarification. But I, I'd rather kind of give you these tenets, and then maybe in conversation we can draw out exactly what that looks like, okay? So I want to start with the image of God, this biblical doctrine of the image of God. I want to move on to an idea of the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God in Christ, and then lastly, the continuity of scripture. And these are kind of the three major theological elements that influence how Reformed folk think about the role of government. Okay, so the first one, of course, is image of God. Uh, image of God is a term you hear pretty regularly these days, even in policy dialogues. You hear image of God. I think actually it was, it was brought up recently at one of the Democratic presidential campaigns, the notion of the image of God and treating people with dignity because they are in the image of God. If you love God, then you'll love people by affirming certain policy initiatives. Um, you know, that's, that's a kind of nice trick of, uh, of political discourse to pull off that. But image of God in the Reformed tradition is a very particular thing, and it comes from this perspective on how you read what's happening in Genesis 1 and everything that follows. 
right? And the idea of, of the, that is so commonly sort of expressed in the reform tradition is that God in Genesis 1 is going about the business of doing a very particular thing. It's come to creation. It is tohu vabohu, right? In Hebrew, it's formless and void. And what does he do? He starts to form it, and he starts to fill it. If you even look at the days of creation, the first three days are forming, the second three days are filling. You start with the lights in the sky on day one, and then you come back to the sky on day four, and you put the sun and the moon there. You start then day two, okay, you know how this goes. Have waters above, waters below, you come back to that on day five, fish above and fish below, that's basically what they're saying, the animals that do this, okay? They do, they, either they do the blue sky or they do the blue water of the Mediterranean. Either way, they're fish, right? So this is kind of uh, this idea of forming the earth and filling it so that it will be sufficient for life. And then what does he do? He puts humanity in, in, on the space, on the land, and he says, now go out and what? Be fruitful and multiply. Subdue the earth. This idea that God as king is sort of building his castle, as it were, which is the earth, and he puts his image in it, which is humanity, and he says, Now go out, fill the earth, and subdue it. And, and, and for the Reform doctrine, that idea of the cultural mandate, fill the earth and subdue it, that's the mandate to go out and make culture. And all that culture involves, all the spheres of culture, whether that's family, schooling, education, government, all of that is springing out of this cultural mandate, which itself springs out of being made in the image of God. So being made in the image of God is not just bestowing a dignity on humanity. It actually is kind of giving humanity its marching orders. Right? Whether you are a believer and a follower of the Creator God or not, you are made in His image, and you have this sort of congenital desire to form and fill the earth. This is why children, I've got five daughters, and when they're building with their blocks, and the little daughter knocks down the blocks, they always scream. There's a reason why, okay? Because this is a part of being human. And government is a part of that outpouring of the cultural mandate being made in the image of God. And that's why we can say things like how we treat our neighbors is important. It has something to do with how we treat God. If you exploit your neighbors, it shows a view of God that you have. If you are not being loving towards your neighbors, or not being loving towards those who are also made the image of God, that has some kind of, that tells you something not only about your religious uh, commitments, but really about your humanity. Okay. That's the first idea, the image of God. Now, the image of God can't be understood alone. It's a part of this broader kingdom of God idea that we have really going all the way back to the Old Testament. In Genesis 1. Okay? When God goes about the work of creating the heavens and the earth. What does he do? He, he starts creating spheres and lets, you know, lets the birds rule over their sphere, the animal what land animals rule over their sphere. And then what does he do? He puts humanity on earth and says, Now you rule over, you subdue, you have dominion over all. Again, this idea of God the king, and in the ancient Near East, it's always the king who does building programs, like Genesis 1. He then makes little vice kings and queens and humanity and says, now go out and continue this work of building the kingdom. You can say the primary goal of building the kingdom is forming the earth and filling it. Okay. Now this is going to be the fastest telling of the story of the Bible we've ever heard. Okay? <laughs> what happens next? Okay, that we run into a little problem, right? Okay, which is called the fall of humanity. And then through a reestablishment to get back on track. I mean, the plan was never to stay in the garden. What does he say? Go fill and form the whole earth. Don't stay there. You're supposed to expand outward until the whole globe reflects back little images of God. But then you have the fall happen. And then you have this reestablishment of the kingdom game plan. It starts with Noah after the flood. What does he tell Noah? Go out, fill the earth, and subdue it. He's telling them that cultural mandate still exists today. Okay? With Abraham, what is he doing? He's saying, I'm going to bless you. So that all of the families of the earth, this is the initial promise, Genesis 12, all the families of the earth will be blessed in you. In the Mosaic Covenant, he's now telling Israel how you're there to live in the land, and yet even as he's doing that, he's giving Israel not only rules for how they are to drive out the people who are living in Canaan, and everyone knows about the harem band and how they're dedicated to the Lord, 
but you even notice in, De in Deuteronomy 4 and elsewhere, he gives rules for how to interact with and expand through diplomacy into other nations outside of the land. So that the psalmist, even the psalms of King David, can say things like, all of the nations will rejoice in the Lord. This is always the end plan of God's work, that all of the nations rejoice in the Lord. Think about Isaiah. If you're, if you're a Christian every Easter, perhaps you, you hear that hymn by Handel, and what does he say, uh, quoting Isaiah 40, when that Messiah comes back in the restoration, when the Son of David restores Israel, like, and all flesh, we'll see it together, right? Because all flesh is a part of this program. It's not just one ethnic community, it's all of the world. Okay. So this idea of the kingdom of God is quite broad, it's quite expansive in the reformed approach. That's why we see Jesus announcing his kingdom uh, right after his baptism under John. Um, we see Paul sending out and himself going out to declare his kingdom, not being satisfied to leave it in Jerusalem and the surrounding country region of Judea but it needs to go to the ends of the earth, which for him probably was Spain. He's probably Spain, he's got Spain in his sights. That would have been the ends of the earth for him, okay? This idea that the kingdom has to be pro, uh, you know, proclaimed all over the face of the earth, and that's what the end back in Genesis 1, being made in the image of God, and that's the plan that Christ is about, that's the project that Christ is about today, that will find the end of the new heavens and new earth, right? Where that creation work that began in Genesis 1 is complete. So it's a big, broad picture of the kingdom. So reform tradition takes it seriously that Christ says, for instance, during his great commission, he says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Notice Christ doesn't say, all authority in the church has been given to me. Or all authority in the proclamation of the gospel and evangelism has been given to me. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What does the author of Hebrews say? He says, Christ is the exact imprint of the God. There's no caveats, there's no exceptions. So when we come to government, this is all sort of sitting in the background, right? When we come to this idea of government, we can't say, well, Jesus in the Bible is in charge of the church, and yet the government kind of exists over here in this neutral space or something. All right. Now, of course, that raises some questions, right? So how indeed then is Christ the Lord of well, we get some examples. I mean, one of them is that Christ, who has all authority on heaven and earth, um, exerts that authority in a variety of different realms. So there's, there's the family again, as we said. There's government. There's church. And we know from, Proverbs, uh, from Revelation 13, rather, that Paul says, Christ exerts his authority on the earth through, the, through Caesar. Okay, in this case, interestingly, Paul's talking about Nero. He says this. Nero is Caesar. That's young Nero, so he's not isn't gone crazy, but um, he's on his way, and when Paul writes of Nero, he says he's been given the sword, and that sword is to constrain evil, it's to protect the peace, and therefore Christians don't think that because you follow King Jesus, who sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, you are to submit to those he has put in authority like Caesar. Okay? So that would be one duty of government under under the reign and under the authority of Christ. It also has this powerful impl implication that every human leader ultimately derives his authority from the one to whom all, all, all authority in heaven and has been given, which is Jesus Christ, which I think we can say, I mean, obviously, that we, have, we have despotic rulers, we have corrupt rulers, we have, we have well-meaning but, um, but, but foolish rulers, and they will ultimately be responsible to Christ. It's from him that they are gleaning, that they are receiving their authority. Paul elsewhere says that we should pray for those who are in authority so that we might be able to continue in all godliness uh, and to worship the Lord in peace and prosperity. Again, this is kind of going to that idea, I would argue, of Genesis 1, of government creating a realm like God is in Genesis 1, as humans are called to do, where life can flourish, where peace and tranquility can take place and where ultimately the gospel of the kingdom can be professed. Okay. So these are kind of the main ideas. Image of God, kingdom of God, and then lastly, and I've kind of expressed this, I hope, just in the way I told the story of the Bible, a, a really radical continuity between the old and the new. 
And we don't say as Christians that the Old Testament is like the Jewish Bible, and it's not for us. And the New Testament is the Christian Bible. We actually argue that that, that is a heresy. I'm not going to argue that. That is just is a heresy. It's called Martianism. <laughs> okay? Um, uh, it's a heresy of the early church. But we rather see, and we take Jesus seriously when he says, I've come to fulfill the law. I've come to fulfill the Torah and the Nabiim and the Katabim, the, the law, the prophets, and the writings. Jesus says, they're speaking unto me. They're speaking about me. I want to understand how Jesus is Christ. Interestingly, the, the New Testament tells us very little about how Jesus is Messiah. You have to go back to the Old Testament notion of Messiah to understand how Jesus is Messiah and Christ. If you want to understand how Jesus in John 2 says, I'm the temple, if you tear down the temple, uh, I'll rebuild it in three days. And even John says, we didn't know what he was talking about that. We figured it out later. What, how is Jesus' temple? You can go back to the Old Testament to see how the temple is the sanctuary of God. It's the outpost of the king. On his, on, you know, in, in his domain, in his palace, that is the earth, that is the land. Okay? So there's this radical continuity that sees that project that begins in Genesis 1 and is unfolded in the story of Israel and finds culmination in the righteous Israelite, the true vine, Jesus Christ, into which us Gentiles, for those of us who are Gentiles here, get to be grafted in, just like Ruth and Naomi got to be grafted into the Old Testament. So there's this radical continuity. So we can go to the whole of Scripture and ask questions. What does this mean for governments? I can go to what we do is do around 22, where you have this issue of putting a fence around your roof. Because if someone goes up on your roof and falls off, it's negligent homicide if you didn't put a fence in. Okay? If you have an ox that's known to gore people, right, then you need to put him in a cage. If you did know he was a gore, that's one thing. It's just like minor manslaughter. But if you knew he was a gore, now it's negligent homicide. This gives us patterns for thought as we think about how we too ought to apply the teaching of the king and the work of constraining evil, bringing peace and prosperity, and creating uh, a space in which flourishing and life can take place. Okay. Now I will say, let me, let me just pause. Uh, hopefully, I know, I know that's really general, but if I just jump into like individual things, this might be confusing. I do want to pause and say there are kind of two ditches even in the reformed camp. At two extremes. There is a ditch that sees so much continuity between the old and the new that they fundamentally argue that we're just trying to reestablish an Israelite theocratic system on earth. Okay. That's been generally re rejected out of mainstream reform theology, but you still will see it pop up from time to time under different names like theonomy or reconstructionism, and that sort of thing. And then there's another side of it, as there are in most Christian traditions, which is really seeing a radical break between the old and the new so that the New Testament really just speaks to sort of spiritual matters, and the Bible really just speaks to spiritual matters and never to actual matters of this human life on this earth that God is forming into his, into his kingdom, forming into the, 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 the theater of his kingdom. Um, we want to be careful of both of those. Generally, the Reformed tradition, now what I've given you today is, is kind of the Dutch continental approach. Uh, if you read Abraham Kuyper, I'm sure some of you are familiar with him. This is, this would be kind of his thinking, Herman Bobbing as well. Um, I don't think of modern day folks who might give expression to this who are operating in the DC area. Kind of hard to think of any right now. Um, the, there is a Puritan English flavor to this, which sounds a little different, but actually shares a lot of these same ideas that I've tried to give expression to here today. Okay? So there's kind of a general overview. The image of God is important, not just because it gives us dignity because it actually gives us our marching orders as humans. Okay? Kingdom of God is important because this is what God is about the work of in the Bible. This is what the Bible is about. Okay? And as we go to our Lord who has all authority on heaven and earth, then we want to know what does he say about this project that we're involved in. And then, of course, thirdly, the continuity of Scripture. We're not dividing it up into strict dispensations, to use that language, even though, interestingly, Calvin would call them dispensations. Okay, um, but uh, now, now we call them epochs or eras or periods. Um, but uh, this idea, we don't divide the Bible up and atomize it. Rather, we're looking at a full pictured story. It begins in Genesis 1, ends fundamentally in Revelation. It's telling the story of God bringing his kingdom to bear on the earth. And the government is a part of that. It's just one part of it, but it's, it's a significant part. Okay, 
had he got kept out. I'm not sure how close I was to my 15 minutes. But let me open it up for questions. Okay? Open it up for questions. Yes, sir. I'm probably the only one that doesn't know the answer. But what was the purpose in your view of God having our Savior Jesus, as a Jew and yet his own people largely rejected him and he attracted the Gentiles. Yeah. Is that is that sort of there had to be close to that hope or something? I, people, everybody may know the answer. Right? That's like my favorite question in the Bible. I think it's the great it's the great twist in the book that makes you go back and read the book the second time. It's, it's the great part of the movie that makes you want to watch it. Again. Um, if you if you buy this reformed idea that the Bible, uh, God's, God's plan for this world was always about all of the people of the earth. Then you know that Israel is the conduit. Israel is a kingdom of priests, right? They are the conduit through which everyone gets to receive the blessings of the redeeming God, the creator God. Um, interestingly, throughout redemptive history, I'm not trying to, I don't want to move to something in technical language, but throughout the history of redemption, there are these events that happen that kind of trigger a major redemptive event. Okay. Um, you know, this is the Exodus. It's a, it's a kind of a big triggering event. And then the fact that Israel doesn't go into the land right away triggers now the wilderness wandering, bumps everything off, seven, you know, 40 years. And then you have Deuteronomy come. And there in Deuteronomy, Moses says, it actually wasn't for them in the first place, it was for you today. You know, this, this idea of these triggering events. Um, and one of those triggering events is that there will be exile and the exile will, start, will result in the repentance of the people, and they will come back. And the Lord will establish them, this is Deuteronomy 3. He will establish them in the land again, in a better situation than they were in before. Okay? This is important. Jesus comes along. No, no one in the Old Testament believes that that has happened by the end of the Hebrew Bible. Nehemiah is the last thing that's said in the Hebrew Bible historically, maybe Esther. Okay, but generally speaking, ne Nehemiah is the last thing that's said. And what does he say? He's praying to God. He says, Lord, don't forget about us. Uh, if this was a play, the curtain would close, and the intermission would begin after Nehemiah prays alone. Lord, don't forget about us. It would open again on either Mary's birth or um, Mary's beginning, sorry, or birthing of Jesus or on John the Baptist, right, or something like that. So Jesus comes. He's the faithful Israelite who triggers now the repentance of the people. That's why John the Baptist is doing a baptism of repentance in the Gospels. Okay. Um, Jesus comes and triggers that restoration so that the apostles can say, here now is the, is, is the light shining in the darkness. Okay. Um, the great twist is that Israel, not en masse, a, a large number of Israelites accept the Messiah King. And yet there is some significant majority in the leadership that rejects him. And that now creates the grounds. The fact that when Jesus goes to Jerusalem, he does not sit on the throne, but he goes to a cross. That creates the redemptive framework for the gospel, which is the proclamation of the kingdom, going out over the face of the earth. Um, Paul, I think, in, in Romans 9 through 7, which is one of the most interesting parts of the New Testament, I think, Paul's wrestling with this. He said, well, what do we think about Israel? What are they? Are they children of the flesh? Are they children of the promise? What if they're believers like me? They're children of the promise. What if they're not? Are they like Dothan and Abiram in the Old Testament who rejected the leadership that God had established? But at one point he says, this I do know is that the fact that the Gentiles are being grafted in en masse is creating the groundwork for Israel to fully repent. Now, we don't know what that means. Honestly, we don't. You know, I think as a biblical scholar, we have to sit back and say, I'm not sure exactly what he's talking about. But he is, he's basically saying this explosion of the kingdom, of the redemptive promises of God and blessings of God coming to the Gentiles, just like they did in the Old Testament. It was always the plan, and yet it's there to create the groundwork for Israel's repentance. Now, is that going to happen over 2,000 years, or is that going to happen in some moment in the future? Did that happen back in the first century? I think that's where we have to then say, I was not exactly the way it's going to work out. Israel's an interesting question. And it's interesting, noticeably, 
Um, it's interesting for the apostles too, and they're not exactly sure. Okay. So the vision you're offering, how important So, um, yeah, the, the phrase inaugurate eschatology is used for a whole blanket of ideas about eschatology. But the, there, there's a reform saying that all theology is eschatology. Okay, and th this is kind of the thing. Even if you go back to Genesis 1, it's really about an eschatology, about the, the world being formed and filled. That's the eschatology of, of Adam, you can say. And mosaic eschatology is that one day you'll be restored to the land of better situation. Christian eschatology, which is receiving all of those previous eschatologies and now applying them in Christ, seems to hold okay, that Christ is inaugurating the coming of the kingdom that Deuteronomy 30, Isaiah 40, Ezekiel 33 and following, they're all talking about. However, the way it's getting applied is in sort of a multi-phased work. Okay? So for instance, Jesus walks, I'll just give you one example. Jesus walks into um, Jesus walks into the northern kingdom. Matthew says this is to fulfill what Isaiah nine says: that people walked in darkness and seen a great light. So that means now restoration is coming, right? according to Isaiah nine and Matthew was three or four. Okay, that's happening, and yet no one believes that Joel two has been fulfilled yet, where the Spirit gets poured out. That doesn't happen for another at least three or so years at Pentecost. So things are kind of happening in phases, but generally speaking, every Day of the Lord prophecy that you have in the Old Testament, the New Testament authors claim for themselves today. In other words, for them, they say it's happening now. Joel 2, it's happening now. Okay. However, and this is the again, sort of the this is the, the eschatology of the New Testament, they say, but if the work's not complete, as a matter of fact, even you're gonna, Jesus says this, you will do greater things than I do. So new creation is inaugurated in Jesus in his resurrection. And yet Paul says, but everyone, when they become a Christian, is new creation. So it's happening today. And yet we're also looking forward to a, a consummation, as the term is often used, for a completion of that fulfillment that will happen in the new heavens and new earth. And you can do that with the temple. Okay, they have a, remember Ezekiel's temple, perfect temple. Jesus says, I'm the temple. Paul says, now we're all the temple, because this is where the spirit exists and, and resides. And yet one day, in the new heavens and new earth, there won't be a temple, because the whole new heavens and new earth will be the temple. Right? You see this kind of three-step phased way of thinking about it. We could say that's uniquely reformed, however it has uh, sort of blossomed in the reformed tradition in the West particularly. So what that means is that as I go to work, if I go to work on Capitol Hill and I'm about the work of the legislation, I need to be thinking as a Christian, bearing witness as a, as a little follower of Jesus Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives with how do I apply the values of the king in the place where I'm governing? No, no, knowing that the values of the king are basically the, the, the values of humanity. It's what's ingrained in all of us. Okay. Um, now, can, does that mean we can't accept? I, I just wrote an article uh, on biblical theological, so this kind of biblical theological program. The biblical theological um, argument for religious freedom, I think, is a really strong one. And it comes out of these ideas of being made in the image of God, God's sovereignty as king, okay, the fact that we as humans, it's not our job to squelch all unbelief, okay? as, as, as the apostles say, God's the judge. Right? We can trust in him to take care of it, and therefore we can operate in a pluralistic society as Christians, and we don't have to, you know, that doesn't mean that we have to reject our gospel beliefs. Okay? I think there's, a, there's ways that we can go into pluralist society, there's ways that we can talk about religious freedom, there's ways that we can interact with countries that don't share the same values that we do, and that do it in a way that's godly and reflective of the king. As we're watching the kingdom unfold, some things have unfolded in full, some things haven't happened yet, so we'll hear before people talk about the already not yet, okay. and that's, that's where that language comes from. Yes, ma'am.
that, 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 that thread, that line actually goes back to church history throughout. It's not, it's not merely a form. You see it, you know, John Adams had uh, written on it. You know, this, was, this was common early in, in American history, in American political thought. Um, I would say it's uniquely reformed. Of course, it had a, a revitalization in the 19th century uh, with American dispensationalism, which I even tell our students you know, at a Reformed Theological Seminary, even if you were raised reformed, because if you're an American, you've got some dispensationalism in you. <laughs> Everybody does. Um, and so that, 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 that thread was common in, 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 you're right, in some Puritan thought, and um, not as much in the continental side, but definitely was, was common, and, and definitely in American. Any other questions? Yeah, I think so. so you mentioned Jesus as a king. Oh, and real quick, and Mark, you tell. I'm happy to keep going, but I also don't want to test well, the crowd's I'm patience. In, in okay. People, if, if any of you have to go, I'm not offended, but I'm also mindful of holding people over long. Okay. Yes, sir. So you mentioned the phrase "Jesus as King" a number of times tonight. Mm -hmm. In my mind, that term is so nebulous and kind of hard to follow. So, I guess, how would you unpack that in terms of Jesus as King? So remember, Can you repeat your question. Okay. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. So, so how is Jesus King, particularly as we talk about already and not yet? Okay. Let, let me make an attempt at it. And again, I think it helps kind of have the big picture. So remember, um, the garden is never the end goal. It was always the beginning point. Right. Jesus is just bringing about the grounds within which that can take. How is he king? Typically, when we talk about Christ's kingly role, as I've been talking about here, I'm talking about him as the son of David, who is, shall we say, this is also the last Adam. I think that's kingly language that Paul uses in similar language in Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, he is coming and being the representative for all humanity, who not only rules over all of humanity, fundamentally, and will come and judge. That's what the Christian belief of final judgment. It's not a new um, and yet also is kind of administering the word. This is what John means when he says, and the beginning is the word, the word is what God, the word was God, and he became flesh, and he's Jesus. Okay, let's paraphrase. It's the new Scott Bird translation here. <laughs> okay, so he's administering the word to us. He's ruling over us as our Lord, not merely our Savior. He's our Savior in that he is saving us from the enemies of Satan, sin, and death, and that's also the job of the king. King is the one who leads the people out in battle, and um, so so he's doing that work for us as well. But there's also this kind of more fundamental way in which he's ruling from heaven, at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He is ruling over the heavens and the earth, and yet, of course, you know this language. He's given the keys of the kingdom, as he says, to the church to advance the work of his gospel reign over the face of the earth. Now, the, the rub, of course, is therefore should we be trying to establish Christian nations and should the church be trying to establish political parties and that sort of thing? Um, I would argue that that's an interesting debate that needs to happen in exegetical circles. So in Calvin's day, okay, having a, having a, a government that was free of religious connection, ecclesial authority, would have been a radical idea. So we shouldn't be surprised that Calvin mixes his views on the work of the church and the work of government. I'm, I'm a Presbyterian minister. I'm ordained as a Presbyterian, so I have to affirm the Westminster Confession. You know, the original Westminster Confession that says that it's the government that calls the synods of the church together, okay? And the 1788 version drops that language. What happens between the 16th century and 1788? happens and of course no American Presbyterians say that they think the government should call the synods of the church so what does that show you there's a little bit of trial and error in all of this right so as we're thinking about the lordship of Christ how do we apply that to the work around us of government there's going to be some trial and error let me, let me posit this not being too controversial when Pete Buttigieg says Proverbs says that we should care for the poor that because for, by caring for the poor we're showing our honor to God. He doesn't say it that way, but that's, that's basically what he's saying. Okay? His theory is not wrong, right? 
the part that's up for debate is, is that the right policy for showing that kind of honors of the Lord? Okay, or is there another free market policies that are better applications of that? And I think that's where reasonable Christians need to sit down and debate and look at general revelation, in other words, the polls and studies and things that are out there, look at the other examples and try to figure out what's, what's the best, wisest application of this value, which is humans have been, it's gonna happen with abortion, it's gonna happen with end of life care. We need to sit down and have these questions. How do we show our honor of the Lord as believers in humanity? Okay. How, do we, how do we show that in our policies? And I do think there's a little trial and error. We should expect that. I'm not surprised that the Westminster divines, as we call them, uh, that they thought that the government should call the Senate. Okay? They thought that during the long parliament, right? Because that's, that's when, for those of you who know history, they wouldn't close parliament. And I think this is true, by the way. The current parliament is now the longest parliament, and it has beaten out, because of Brexit, it's beaten out the old long parliament, which is where the Westminster Confession is written. <laughs> so that's your little point, point of order. Um, so, Back then, they thought, well, of course the government should protect the faithful teaching of the church. And nowadays, we'd say, you know, there's some problems with that. Okay, we're in a new context. We need to apply this. We need to revisit the life of the world around us and apply this in a way that's the most, that's the most wise and, uh, and faithful. Yes, ma'am. I have a similar theme. Um, within the framework of the Alt-Right movement, there's a lot of people who are saying, You understand of work and Christian hope? Okay, so in this already not yet scheme, okay, which means that Christ has established his kingdom on earth, and yet we all pray this, by the way, that God's kingly authority in heaven will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're praying for that, you know, that perfect divine will that is at work in the, in, in the heavenlies to be applied on earth. As we're about that work, Jesus has said, you are a part of it. So when you go out into the world, don't work as if you are serving, you know, Bill, the manager of your department. Okay, all right. Work as if you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you go out and you do your job, whatever that is, whether you're a pastor or you're, um, you know, uh, you're, you're putting rivets and steel put in metal planks. Okay, regardless of what you're doing, you're doing it as it is unto the Lord, and it is an expression of that cultural mandate to fill the earth and sink it. That it's actually deeply human to work. Notice, by the way, work is, contrary to Islamic theology, work is actually a part of the pre-sin state. Okay? Work is not a result of sin, as some Muslims believe. Not all, but Islam is this complicated too. Okay? But as some believe that work is a result of sin, we actually don't. We believe that work was actually present before the fall. And this is a working out of our identity humans made in the image of God. Now what fruit will that bear in the new heavens and new earth? I think that's a place where Christians can disagree. Okay, we do know that Paul says in Philippians 1 that no, nothing that we labor in will be in vain. Okay, but it will all come to completion in the day of the Lord. So I think we have to, there's, there's a possibility. We might be enjoying you know, I think somebody who's not controversial. We might be enjoying Handel's Messiah in the new heavens and new earth. <laughs> I was about to say Rothko, and I thought, well, I don't know about this crowd. They may not like Rothko. Uh, you know, we might be enjoying art in the new heavens and new earth. We might be enjoying, enjoying good music in the new heavens and new earth. Okay? That's a question that's, that is left open. It's authorized in Scripture, but I don't think it's clear. Yes, sir. You think if ever appropriate to refer to Second one, that's a good question. I don't know. So let me start with the, the one that I don't have the answer to. Um, uh, I, I did write something on immigration, and one of the criti criticisms that I got was that I, I said in passing that the new heavens and the new earth would be borderless. And someone said, how do you know? I said, I don't know. I actually don't know. So uh, we do know that it will be marked by, and I, I take it apocalyptic literature that we have in Revelation, is, is giving us highly symbolic spiritual vision of what it would look like. So uh, we know that it's going to be marked by no death, no tears, 
and uh, an, an unadulterated rule of God so that his presence fills the earth. And we don't even need a temple. We don't even need a sun. Okay? What, now, apply that how you will, because God's presence, his character, is filling the earth. Um, does that leave space for some kind of subdomains? Maybe. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, because I'm an Old Testament prophet, I know that what Jesus did looked so unlike what people might have anticipated in the Old Testament that from our point of view today, guessing about the new heavens and the new earth is kind of a fool's area. We have, we have some principles, okay? Um, and just like the Old Testament believers did, but we have some principles that we can look forward to, but I don't think we have a lot of details. Um, the other question, can a nation be a Christian nation? Now, I am fundamentally a linguist, so I have to say people can use that language and mean a thing by it that is legitimate. Okay, so that's my linguist caveat. Secondarily, should we use that language? Is that helpful? And um, you could say something like, I mean, let's say, let's say the United States is founded on you know, explicit Christian principles. I know Dan Dreisbeck, he spent a lot of time writing about this. I trust him. Um, I'm not an expert in that. I can't articulate that as well as he can. But you know, he's arguing that, yes, there's some kind of clear Christian themes that show up in the Constitution of the United States and the, and the philosophies that are influencing the founding. Can you then, therefore, say it's a Christian nation? Um, I don't think you can say so in any kind of gospel sense. Okay? I think the Christian nation is the church. That's the Christian nation. Okay? Now, can you say that a nation is predominantly formed by Christian values and beliefs? Sure. That's a legitimate use of human language. Is that controversial? If anyone wants to argue with that, feel free. But I feel like it's kind of bland and it's non-controversial. Let me ask you something controversial. Okay. Uh -oh. Stir the pot. So uh, all this conversation about quote unquote Christian nationalism. Do you have any reflections on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm hesitant about it because I am hesitant about civil religion, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm hesitant, I mean, again, so I'm an Old Testament scholar, so I know I keep going back and citing it, but one of the problems of Old Testament Israel is not that she has rejected Yahweh, it's that she's, she's worshiping the Lord alongside everything else, you know? But look, think about Ezekiel's vision, the problem with the temple is not that they're not worshiping Yahweh, it's that they also have Demuzi, the Sumerian wheat god in the northern palace, and they've got Dagon there in front of the portico, and they're worshiping you know, the creepy crawlies down in the basement. Um, that's the problem, is this syncretism. So I'm, I'm cautious about syncretism that I think has shown up in America as a kind of civil religion, particularly in the 20th century. And I think still has, has some proponents today. So when you talk about a Christian nationalism, I understand the value of nationalism. I understand the, I understand the art, people who are arguing that the word, that the, the language of nationalism um, is, le is a legitimate political philosophy. I understand their argument. When you attach Christianity to it, you now run the risk of um, ignoring the global implications of the gospel, okay? By raising up Christians who are of certain nationalities over Christians who are of another nationality, okay? Christians, I'm talking to Christians now, they run the risk of this. I'm not really, I kind of don't care what non-Christians think about it. I, I feel that Christians might start to think, well, Christians of this nationality have some kind of, should be shown some sort of partiality, which is, I think, anathema to the scripture. Okay? Both the witness of the Old and the New Testament. Um, that said, again, if it's being used to, you know, descriptively of, of a view of national interest that is informed by Christian values, I can see how that has some kind of usefulness, but it, it, there's a danger that comes alongside it. So uh, this recent conference on Christian nationalism, I heard some of the talks there, and some of them I thought, these are great. And some I thought, yeah, this is really problematic. Okay. And I think we're still working out what those, what those terms mean to. Which conference did that Uh The conference of about a month ago. Um, who, who, who ran? Um, uh, Peter Thiel was there. He made the headlines for a while. Yeah, the National Conservatives. Yeah, this was kind of a, there was some Christian nationalism language being thrown around that conference. Some of it I thought I can see how that's legitimate, okay. and some of it I thought that's, that's clearly problematic for the gospel, the scope of the gospel. Yes, sir. Uh, do you believe that the American Revolution could be reconciled with Romans 13? Yes, can the American Revolution be reconciled with Romans 13? Um, 
I do think it can because it raises questions about about jurisdiction okay? and, 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 the, and the legitimacy of the king's jurisdiction in the colonies. Okay, that's the way you'd have to go with that. In other words, you have to go in the direction that he is not in a fundamentally in kind of a fundamental. Um, practical way actually governing in the colonies and therefore a local government then needs to be established. I think that's how you would have to go. Otherwise, you're right, just breaking the rules there too. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're saying that before the Declaration of Independence, the King of England and really the British government was not the legitimate government. Had abdicated, had in some way abdicated their authority. I think you can make the same argument. It is, this is, I mean, well, couldn't you say that about Supreme Court absolutely. decisions? Absolutely. So you need to question that. No, this, this is where reasonable people need to sit down and discuss. So, I mean, obviously there's extremes. Okay, I mean, I think you know, it was the Third Reich. It was Hitler's Third Reich. Okay, is he abdicated his that legitimacy as uh, a figure of authority in Germany? I, I would say, unarguably, we can all agree on that, I hope. Okay? And yet then on the other side, yeah, you have, okay, so I don't agree with Barack Obama or Donald Trump's policies, or Donald Trump's tweeting for that matter, because he abdicated his authority. Okay, now we're moving into this, this is, this is a lot more uh, unclear, right? So what we need to do is sit down and, just, and develop you know, what hallmarks are and what, what, what kind of things we're gonna be looking for when we make those decisions. But I think the, the revolutionaries were thinking Britain has given up the, the Commonwealth is not a legitimate, um, is not a legitimate for the problems. And that's fundamentally what they're arguing. Yes, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I said um, about independence. I wondered once the possibility had broken out, would there be an additional argument, you know, as a self-defense or Yes, right. And now also, I mean, you're establishing, notice what you're not doing. You're establishing, it's not, it's not that you're moving to anarchy, away from, the monarch to anarchy, moving into another, you know, argu arguably authorized, you know, um, authority structure in the colonies, and then once you have, uh, you know, the, once you have warfare break out, now you're defending the sovereignty of the colonies. Okay. Um, this is one of those situations too, where I think and this, this, is, this is true for Christians. Oftentimes, you're coming along for the ride. I mean, do think about Daniel operating in Babylon and then in Persia. He's along for the ride. He's trying to figure out, how do I do what I'm called to do in light of these different kings, Nebuchadnezzar, and then, um, and then Cyrus, at least as it's recorded in Daniel. You know, that is, I think, a question that a Christian can ask who's a revolutionary. And that's a different question than what is George Washington and the Founding Fathers asking. Okay, there's one where you're actually affecting the change, and then the other one where now the world is changing around you, and you have to think, as a Christian, how do I apply this into the, the situation in which I'm on? That's 99% of the Christians who are asking these questions. Time for one more question, if there is one. So I guess to continue this train of thought, um, I am wondering how you reconcile the experience of the early church under the pressure of Rome, sort of pre-Constantine, pre-Theodosius, with, I guess, the arguments, the sermons, I mean, I think, so let's, let's say the Alexandrian community of Christians had decided that Rome's cruelty um, had destabilized its authority as an imperial structure and had declared independence. Um, I, I don't know anything in Paul or in the teachings of Christ that would say because Christians are involved in that program that's somehow wrong or wrong application of their religion. A little different for the church to declare out like its its own self rule. This is where reformed theology and I shouldn't say self rule, but its own sort of political governance is where the reform tradition does differ strongly with Roman Catholic traditions. Um, the, the idea of the church being its own political entity seems to be how you would apply and, and, and recognize how the church is acting in, in light of the 
persecutions of the early church. Um, now, this is a question that's still active today in parts of Rwanda. Okay, what, what do you do when the Christian South is wrestling with oppression from the Muslim North? And you have whole towns that are all in the same church, right? This is, defines what it means to be a part of the town. Do you, do you give them guns? Right? I mean, this is fundamentally, that's what the question is. Do you, do you help them defend themselves? And I do believe that there's a, there's a biblical and a Christian argument for, for doing that. And yet, we have to always be mindful. In other words, Merely pacifists on these questions, and yet we do have to be mindful of civil religion and the dangers of secretism. Okay, what the scripture teaches. Okay. All right, thank you, Scott. Thank you.